This is episode number 229 with co-founder at Cursor, Adam Weinstein. Welcome to the Super Data Science Podcast. My name is Kirill Eremenko, data science coach and lifestyle entrepreneur. And each week we bring you inspiring people and ideas to help you build your successful career in data science. Thanks for being here today. And now let's make the complex simple. Welcome back to the Super Data Science Podcast, ladies and gentlemen. Super excited to have you back here on the show. And today we've got a very special guest joining us for this episode, Adam Weinstein, who is a co-founder at Courser. Now, what you need to know about Courser is it's a company, a tool that helps organize data science assets. So if in your company you're working on many different data science projects, you have lots of different types of code, uh, different dashboards, different metadata, uh, different teams working on these projects, all of that can be organized with Courser. Um, and in this podcast, you will find out quite a lot of interesting things. So first of all, we'll talk about um, Adam's own uh, journey, his background, how he uh, went from working at Deloitte uh, all the way to working at LinkedIn and then founding his own company. So if you're interested in actually being an entrepreneur in the space of data science, this podcast is definitely for you. Uh, plus, we'll talk about uh, the concepts of data literacy and citizen data scientists, and you will find out how Cursor can help you out in uh, this journey and uh, of course, in general, what it means for an organization to be data-driven, data-literate, and what citizen data scientists are. Um, so if you are a founder of an organization or if you're an executive, this podcast is also for you. And in general, if you are interested in becoming more data-literate and interested in the concept of citizen data scientists, whatever your level is in the organization, once again, this podcast is for you. So on that note, can't wait for you to meet Adam in person and uh, get to connect with him and learn all these amazing insights from him. Without further ado, I bring to you Adam Weinstein, co-founder of Corso. Welcome to the Super Data Science Podcast, ladies and gentlemen. Today, we've got a very exciting guest on the show, Adam Weinstein. Adam, how are you going today? Doing great, doing great. How about yourself? Very good as well, thanks. Um, we were just chatting before how cool it is, like the time difference. Like I'm in Brisbane, Australia. It's like almost 10 a.m. What's the time for you in San Francisco? Yeah, it's like a little before 4 p.m. the day before. So it's we're uh, like just talking up the day almost. Yeah, I can tell you all about like in the morning you'll have some rain, then it'll get sunny. <laughs> <laughs> all about your future day. We, um, we, we could use some rain here. It's about <laughs> six years of uh, drought that we're trying to dig our way out of. That is crazy. That is crazy. Like I heard about the. Um, the fires that are that were happening in uh, California is that still going on? Yeah, no. So they're luckily all you know they've all burned out. I guess at this point, um, unfortunately, like the they, they finally contained the fire about twelve hours before the rain came. So it was uh, okay. like poor timing. But yeah, it's it's uh, the, the the impact has been pretty massive. Like it's fascinating. Vice just did an interesting special over the weekend on uh, sort of like what does this mean in the long run? Because we've had now two or even three years in a row, we've had tons and tons of uh, acreage burned and houses burned, people displaced, people killed, et cetera, that, that just because of these, these wildfires that have started. And um, interesting to think if that's not necessarily, uh, you know, uh, an anomaly anymore, right? Is it becoming the normal? But, yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe a topic for another time. <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. And I, I recently saw a visualization of, um, they had, what was it? I think they had like the, the 50 states of the US uh, yeah. and uh, they had like how often abnormal weather uh, events happen uh, over the past like 60 years and all, all in the same picture it's like as and it's animated and you can see like okay at the start it was like here something popped up here 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 and then as you get into the 2000s it's like wow. everything's like red every year like something's popping up it's crazy yeah. we might we might actually include that in in the video version on this podcast so people can see yeah it. no it's interesting i mean like the, the size of the of the area that burned i think was roughly equivalent to almost six san francisco's or you know wow about 12 new york new york cities at least right it's like if you imagine like you know now granted these aren't these aren't densely populated areas but still 
uh, you know, that if you've been to one of these towns, right? You say, okay, that entire town burned and then multiply that by 12 or, or six here in San Francisco. Right? It's, it's a, it's a huge amount of land that just totally, you know, wow. uh, been, been destroyed. Oh, that's crazy. Um, all right. Well, let's move on to data science. Hopefully that sure. situation will, will get better with the fires. Um, data science. So Adam, very excited to have you on the show. You have an amazing um, like journey through data science with lots of highlights, LinkedIn, Bright, and now your own company. Um, I, I don't even know where to start. Let's, yeah. <laughs> let's maybe uh, talk about um, if somebody were to ask you off the street for the first time and you were introducing it, how do you introduce yourself to people? Like that, that like what, yeah. who is Adam Weinstein and what do you do? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I guess I'm a data geek, right? No. Um, you know, background is, is interesting. Like you said, like I started life out of school, like every undecided undergraduate, I was a consultant for a couple of years. Mm. Um, and, and, and that, and I've always been... si signed me up for that as well. Yeah. Same, yeah. same story. Yeah. Deloitte. Yeah. So, so I'd always been interested in the hardware side of, of, uh, you know, technology. So I actually got into infrastructure consulting. So we were helping really large companies like figure out how to deploy data centers around the world. Yeah. Um, and at the time, like there, there was this big wave of, of virtualization that was occurring, right? So like back in the day, you'd have, you know, one application on one server. And you know, even if it only ran a job for 10 minutes a day, right? It would, it would be an individual server that would be wasted for the other 23 hours and 50 yeah. minutes. Um, so there, you know, virtualization was, okay, can you, can you compact multiple processes under the same box, right? Now it's, now it's containerization or Kubernetes or whatever, very, you know, fast forward 15 years. But um, so, so I happened to get, a little bit of a focus in data infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I, after I had done my sort of tour in, in the consulting world, I uh, joined a company, a startup actually called Exact Target. Um, we had an office in Sydney, ironically, but uh, mm -hmm. never made it. Um, but uh, Exact Target so you, was you, marketing. You worked in Sydney? Say what? You worked in Sydney? Uh, no, we had an office in Sydney. We, oh. I, I worked in Sydney. Okay. Um, I wish I worked there, but... Uh, <laughs> But no, I, I worked in uh, Indianapolis, which was, uh, I had lived in Chicago as a consultant and moved back to Indianapolis where I grew up uh, after, after being a consultant for a while. Mm -hmm. um, so exact target was in the email marketing space. So it's now, it's currently Salesforce Marketing Cloud. So Salesforce bought the company about five years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's now the, the, I think it's the largest email sender in the world still. Like most large brands that uh, send out any quantity of email, right? Whether it's, you know, Nike or uh, large banks or, uh, you know, anything in between, right? If you're sending... You need to send, uh, you know, a few hundred emails, a few hundred million emails in a few minutes. Like you tend to use something like an exact target or today's Salesforce mm -hmm. marketing cloud, but they didn't really have a, a data team at the time. So um, that was a, a role I kind of jumped into uh, shortly after getting there. And it was, it was, it was fascinating, right? We were running the, the world's largest Microsoft SQL server, which I'm not sure that's something you want to brag about, but it was, uh, <laughs> it was, it was, it was a fascinating time, right? The company had gone from sending, you know, a few million emails on behalf of a few small businesses to, you know, hundreds of millions of emails on behalf of, you know, Groupon and Nike and Bank of America. And How like crazy is that, that like uh, a company that's running the world's biggest SQL server and working with so many like users yeah. and, and companies, they didn't have a data team. Like, like right now in this day and age, 10 years later, it's, it's unfathomable for a company. Yeah. That yeah. I mean, data team. Th there was like a infrastructure team that kept the lights on. Right. And like, they literally were hiring the architects from Microsoft just to keep the thing running, like that were <laughs> on Microsoft SQL Server, because it was such a, a kind of a, a fire. <laughs> mm. Use or refrain from using other language, but um, yeah, it was it was it was a mess. But um, you know, it's interesting, right? Like even data companies struggle sometimes. I feel like to like step away from it and say, okay, how can we look at the data that we have and be more intelligent um, about how we use it? Uh, so yeah, we you know, we were really a data driven company, right? We helped companies identify you know, okay, you've got this list of emails that you've accumulated from your website or from orders. There was a lot in retail at that time. Um, how do you market to them in a, in a more cost-effective manner as opposed to TV ads or print mailers or things like that? And, you know, we, we, we'd start, you know, the company was growing through the, the recession in 2008, right? So I got there in 2007. Um, ironically, we filed to go public at the end of the, end of the year, although it was, we ended up pulling it because it was such a terrible time. But the uh, business did phenomenal through the recession, mostly because it was a low-cost alternative. Like mm -hmm. the cost send an email, you know, as a fraction of a penny, um, the cost to, uh, you know, send something in the mail or put a TV ad is, you know, infinitely higher. 
Um, and so, so yeah, one of the first first players there, one of the first people. Yeah, it was first first data uh, player at least there. Yeah. Um, and so you know, we 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 did everything from how do you identify when a customer is like, you know, high risk and looking to churn to hey, this customer just signed up yesterday and they've already blown through their utilization. So like, why don't we talk to them and find a better product for them? That kind of thing. And it was very early days of of, of data, and I'm not even sure it was called data science. It was probably more business intelligence. Mm. Yeah. Um, but uh, it, it, it was a fun time. So I was there for a few years. Um, I got to about 1,200 employees, and I decided I want to go to do something small again. Um, and, I, and I actually took kind of a brief hiatus from data. So I was always a, a sarcastic, like, greeting card sender. I used to send, you know, cards to family and friends. Um, I had this crazy idea that uh, you know, the challenge was with, with cards is, like, you can go down the street and you can buy some cards. Uh, but, like, if they're, if they're not the style that you like or in the language that you need, like, you're kind of, you have no options, right? It's not like you can yeah. just go uh, find another store. And card, card, card stores were kind of dying too. Um, so it, it came up with this idea like, okay, if you just print everything on demand, you can have a selection of inf an infinite number of cards. Someone could come online in, in, or in Australia, order a card, have it printed and mailed in New York today and get to the person tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, if you just have this distributed print infrastructure. Uh, so that was a company called Ingree. Um, we were a small team, uh, grew it, uh, never raised any money, ironically, but debated uh, moving it out west to do so. And coincidentally, it was bought by the printer. So the, the printer that was, was doing all this was like, hey, we want to get in that business. And we, we, we talked over, you know, drinks and they decided, okay, well, what if we just brought you on board? And so I uh, ended up selling them, uh, you know, in greed. And, and now it's called the, the, the greeting card shop. So it still exists. Mm -hmm. um, it's funny, I still get their emails every holiday season. <laughs> and then uh, you know, I moved out west. Uh, and this is probably really where a real start in data kind of occurs, at least modern day data, uh, yeah. to work with a company called Bright. Um, and so Bright was, was a, a company in the machine learning space that helped match jobs to people. So if you think about the job search process going back a few years, you'd go to a career builder, a monster, and indeed, you'd type in a, a job title and you'd say, hey, I want to be a software engineer or a product manager or a marketing coordinator or whatever it may be. And then they'd show you all the lists of jobs that had those titles. Um, but companies were getting a little creative with titles. I think uh, the, the, the joke we used to use was, you know, what if the job was called Ninja? Um, you know, that, nowadays, I don't think hopefully anybody uses that title, but maybe they do. Uh, so we had built an algorithm that would basically parse a resume and a job description, uh, calculate the normalized skills that were basically, that were being used, right? So like, you know, Oracle and Facebook and SAP and Microsoft and Google may all recruit people that can write Java, but like how do they describe, how they describe it is very different. Um, and so, you know, we, we, would, we would come up with a way to, to normalize that, uh, the skills being represented on both the job description and the resume, and then score the fit between the two of them. Mm -hmm. um, and so instead of uh, searching for a job title, you would actually just upload and show you all the jobs you were qualified for. Um, and so that was, that was a fun, uh, fun couple of years. Uh, so you know, it's, sorry, it's kind of like a recommender engine, right? Yeah. Like you upload your resume and then instantly you get uh, jobs that you put. Does that, is that still used by like online when I go like on Indeed or Glassdoor and stuff like that? Yeah. So, so, so LinkedIn bought Bright in 2014. Um, yeah. And so when you do, uh, when you perform a job search on LinkedIn, that scoring algorithm is actually being used behind the scenes uh, to oh, cut jobs. So you still do search for a title, but, but there's sort of a marriage of the title and then that score that help. Um, recommend what jobs to see and then oh, okay. LinkedIn emails on job recommendations. Um, I'm sure there are still some mistakes in the algorithm, but yeah, like they're, 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 those, those uh, recommendations are being informed by the same score. Interesting. So it's, so they, owned by LinkedIn, but yeah. So it uses the information on your profile when you search for stuff. That's exactly. so cool. That's so cool. So like it's important to get your profile right, not just for other people to see it, but also for your search results to be most relevant to you. Right. And, and increasingly, like, so LinkedIn's core business, right, is this recruiter product that if you're, you know, a, a recruiter inside a large corporation, you pay a, you know, a substantial fee to be able to search across the entire LinkedIn network. Mm -hmm. And you can't, you know, you can then send an in-mail to, to anybody. Increasingly, uh, you know, that, that search process is converting to a recommendation process. So mm -hmm. instead of the recruiter saying, hey, uh, I'm looking for software engineers that have three years of job experience and have worked at these five companies, um, LinkedIn's trying to push candidates to those recruiters and that's being informed by the same recommendation algorithms. Mm. I think it, it, you know, the downside, I guess, of the, Hey, you have to put all your sort of life's work into this profile, but the more you put there, the better off you know, people that might be looking to hire you will be. Although 
as a data scientist, you're probably not hurting for uh, you know inbound interest in being hired. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's the opposite there. Uh, and and uh, just like a, maybe a year or, or two ago, LinkedIn started when somebody endorses somebody for yeah. like their skills. Now it's not as easy as before. Just like click, 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 click. Now you have to explain yeah. how do you know the person, what level yeah. of endorsement, and so on. I think that's probably got to do with that whole system as well. Yeah, it has to do with like how how knowledgeable or how, how like what's the quality of that recommendation. So you know, before anybody could go endorse anybody for anything, and you know, I could endorse somebody for like uh, material science engineering, and I don't know the first thing about material science. Um, mm -hmm and vice versa, right? Someone could endorse me for something that I might be good or might not be good at, but even if they don't know anything. And th th there, was a, there was actually a time, maybe embarrassing LinkedIn history, where you could create your own skills. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, we, we famously endorsed people for, you know, very inappropriate things like, uh, you, know, uh, you know, I don't know what a good example would be, like, uh, you know, dropping things on the floor or <laughs> tripping in public places or things like this. And, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, not skills that anybody would want in their profile, but you could just endorse anybody for anything. And so why yeah. not? Uh, As they, they you endorse them, you create a skill for them, right? You endorse them for something they don't even have on their profile. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Good times. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so no, that, that, yeah, they're trying to get the, the quality aspect figured out because it's like that, that really is what tells you, you know, whether somebody's good at something, right? If, if somebody that's in a domain can endorse somebody else in that same domain for something that should be a very, you know, valuable endorsement. And that's yeah. what they're trying get to with with skills yeah totally totally gotcha okay what happened after linkedin so you were there so you, yeah. you were right until they got acquired and then you were for what two years and then at linkedin you were for another three years yeah exactly so so here i was like this sort of startup data guy at bright right like we had a small team but was wasn't uh you know wasn't linkedin size um and so when i got link got to linkedin they actually the joke was they didn't necessarily know what to do with me right they're like okay here Here's a guy that knows how to build data teams in small organizations. We've already got 200 of those people. Like, you know, what do you want to do? Um, but it turned out that um, LinkedIn had just built, a, <coughs> sorry, an office in China, so in Beijing. And, and the way doing business in China works, like, it was technically a subsidiary. So, like, we had, uh, you know, we, we had a couple of folks there, but, like, we were building it out as if it were an independent company. And, and it had to be autonomous, right? Like, like, you know, LinkedIn in California didn't know the first thing about succeeding in China, right? We had hired a team that had been really... Uh, successful previously, a couple from Google, from Apple, and, and elsewhere. Um, and we just wanted to give them the autonomy to do so. And so I became the like data ops guy that was sent there to help build out all the tooling that they needed to be successful against, you know, most of the LinkedIn data that already existed. Um, but the, the recommendation was to don't necessarily use what we already have. Think of things as if you were doing it from the ground up. So I was there like two weeks when they asked me to do this. And so they, uh, I started getting on a plane, going back and forth every six weeks. And my, um, you know, my, my first question was, okay, well, how are things done around here, right? What are the metrics we care about? Where, are the, where is the data? You know, you know, show me models that are relevant. Like, you know, how do I get an understanding of this business that was about 5,000 employees at the time? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, and, and the challenge I found is that there was no one place to go. So, like, I, I had about 200 or so. It was like 180 coffees. Uh, ironically, I don't drink coffee, but like 180 meetings over over uh, the course of about 18 months, where I just met you know leaders in different domains and, and said, okay, you know, okay, you're you're the marketer for this product. How do you measure you know new customers? What is the definition of a customer? You know, what's the definition of a customer at risk? What's the definition of a successful customer? Like all of these things that they were not captured in one place. They were just in individual people's heads or on their local machines. So sorry, is this this is in the main LinkedIn? You're getting that information main LinkedIn. on the main LinkedIn, yep. and, then, and, then, and then I would take that, go to China and say, okay, here's, here's how we do it in the U S yeah. and you, know, you could use this if you want, or I should say the rest of the world. Uh, yeah. we, we were supporting a global business yeah. kind of sort of being this one carve out. Um, and, and so, yeah, like that, that was, that was sort of my, you know, 18 month window of life where like literally I'd come back I'd pick a new domain, a new product, new area, go learn as much as I could about it. And then fly sort of like, you know, show the team what I had figured out and then go do the same thing all over again. Yeah. And, ended up developing was this great corpus of knowledge of, Hey, here's data inside LinkedIn. Yeah. Uh, knowing that every time I interviewed someone like chances are three weeks later it would change, but like, you know, it, it was relatively up to date. Um, and a bunch of people around the business started using it as well. Right. So it was a collection of code of, you know, like, of like terminology, nomenclature, like data definitions, um, a little bit of like, okay, here's where we keep, like we had a bunch of different reporting systems because 
you know, we were a software company, so we, we, you know, we built them every time we needed them. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so like, you know, here's the reporting system for this metric. Here's the reporting system for that metric. Sometimes it was Tableau. Sometimes it was homegrown. Sometimes it was something that had been there for 13 years that we didn't know why it was there. Um, and so, yeah, like it was, it was a fascinating uh, journey, but I think it taught me that like, you know, even in a really innovative company, it, it can be hard to keep your arms around what's going on where and, and how to find answers to sort of even the most basic data questions, which I think as a data scientist is like, before you can have fun with data as a data scientist, like you have to know where things are mm -hmm. and you have to know, you know, what it means and, and can you trust the data? Is it, is it of high quality? Is it, is it being refreshed? Is this the source of truth, if you will, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that drove me to, to start Cursor, right? Which, which I, can, I can talk about, but that was, uh, that was sort of the journey at LinkedIn, right? So I left last March uh, mm -hmm. officially to, uh, you know, decide that a paycheck was no longer worth it. <laughs> did you, did you already know when uh, you were leaving that you have this idea for Cursor or did you leave and then um, come up with the idea for Cursor later on? Yeah, so I had a good understanding of what I wanted to do. It wasn't, I don't think it was, you know, perfectly nailed down. What I, what I wanted to do was spend a couple of months talking to other companies, particularly outside of the area of technology, like Silicon Valley could be a little bit of a bubble in terms of how we look at problems and how we solve them. And so I wanted to talk to banks and industrial companies and retailers and understand like, what is data inside of their organization and how, you know, how do people interact with it? Um, you know, I, I had a good sense though of what I wanted to build in terms of, you know, somewhat of a data catalog, but something that was more interactive for the average business user. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that, that was, the premise, I think we, we honed it for, uh, you know, a few months before we actually started the company and raised money and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I had a strong sense of what it was we were going to build it. Maybe 80% of it, I guess you could say. Okay, awesome. So that leads us to Cursor. So yeah. uh, first of all, why the name? What, why Cursor? Yeah, so I, I've liked the name Cursor since long before I came up with the idea. Um, and, and, you know, I guess you could say the, the concept to me is like, in, in, in a knowledge management kind of problem, which I guess you could generically call cursor a knowledge management you know, solution, although it's not generic knowledge management, it's specific to data. Um, I think that uh, you know, the, the notion of a cursor helping you seek or find something is really, um, I think, powerful. And then you know, I think the, uh, you know, there, there's also a database cursor concept, although you know, if you talk to a DBA about a database cursor, they'll, they'll, they'll run you out of the room because they're like not very performant. But, um, I think that the, the sort of marriage of those two, right, that it's steeped in data, at least the concept of a cursor, or even code, right? I mean, cursors have existed in programming languages for a long time. Um, and then, uh, you know, the notion of like, okay, people can, can relate to a cursor helping to find something, whether it's on the screen or potentially, you know, buried in a data lake somewhere, right? Like, um, I've always liked the name. And so uh, it just so happened, you know, I found that the, the dot .com was available. and uh, Oh, wow. Between the two of them, I was like, okay, well, this is the right name. And yeah, so we yeah, had yeah. The domain before we had the company and the idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah, gotcha. And, uh, and so cur cursor, like, like the cursor you have on the screen. That, 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 yeah, 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 exactly. That, uh, that's so cool. Like, uh, re rarely those domain names are available, short ones like that. But, yeah, yeah. It'll be interesting to see if domain names last. Like, you know, there, there was sort of a real estate gold rush for domain names. And now that you've got so many other, you know, TLDs, right? Dot .io, dot .app, you know. Uh, other things right that is it is the dot com is valuable i guess we'll, yeah. we'll find it. yeah we'll see as soon as google updates their search algorithms right now i think yeah exactly the exactly most easiest to find okay well cursor so um tell us about about the company what what does it do like we, like we've heard your story obviously you've built up a lot of experience knowledge and data and then like some uh pressing issues that you actually saw firsthand um <laughs> how how does cursor go about solving them and, and just in general give us an overview yeah yeah so so cursor um you know the challenge if i sort of had to like boil it down that we had at linkedin is that we had a bunch of users across the organization that were creating content right could be ad hoc sql code could be dashboards in tableau could be an excel spreadsheet could be a, my, a python model right um and and there was no one place to go find all of that um mostly because everybody was using their own set of tools uh, so, you know, you had people that had locally installed SQL editors, a Tableau, I guess you, if you were looking for a Tableau dashboard, you could search if it had been published, you know, to, to the server. Um, but there was a lot of work that was being done on the local machine, even Jupyter notebooks, right? For the most part were installed in local environments. 
Um, so, so cursor is a tool that a, that, that a user can start with uh, or a team um, that if, if they work inside the product, it, it has a built in SQL editor, it has a built in Python environment. Um, it connects to all these places where data lives into BI solutions like a Tableau and any database um, that you might use. And it, and it basically curates in, in sort of an, an intelligent way, all the data that, it, that it's seeing. So, um, or I should say metadata that it's seeing, right? It's actually not looking at the raw data itself. Uh, so, you know, if you've connected to three databases, you've written some SQL, you've written some Python, you've connected to Tableau, it helps build a, a, a single uh, corpus of, of knowledge that, a, that any user in that business can come search and helps in, in the goal of being to find things that have already been done or answers that may have already, that may already exist. So an example might be, you know, I'm an analyst and I'm trying to figure out, uh, you know, how many products have we sold today, generically speaking, right? If somebody else has done that work, how do I find them? If I haven't, how do I find what table has the product data in it? If I do find that table, how do I know that table is the right table? Um, so we, we help build uh, you know, a place where people can come find what they're looking, you know, find an answer to a data question, make use of data if they don't necessarily know where, uh, what the answer may be, and then understand what they're seeing. Um, so it's, it's uh, you know, simply speaking, you could think of it like an Evernote or Dropbox for, for an analyst or for a data user. It could be also for a data scientist. Um, but it, but it's, it's designed to scale you know, as wide as need be, right? So you, data we know is siloed, right? As are the teams that use it. Um, and so the solution's kind of designed to fit that, right? You can start with one team and you can have another team come on later. Um, this was a challenge that we saw on LinkedIn. We looked for a solution in the market to try and like solve it for the business. And the problem was we couldn't get everybody to agree. But yet that, you know, the, the, the perfect prevented, you know, was the enemy of the good, right? Like mm. you can't you don't have a solution for everybody. You know, nobody had anything. So this is designed to solve that you know, challenge with, hey, one user, one team can start using cursor, they can at least start sharing with themselves. And then typically what you'll see is like, okay, another user gets jealous of this corpus of knowledge, they'll come on, and that brings their team with them. And it kind of grows from there. Um, wow, that is such a cool idea. So it's, it's like, and I, I'm, I'm already like hooked, because I'm, I think of myself as a very organized person. And yeah. what you described it sounds like a, as a tool to organize data science assets, you know, whether it's code, whether it's data, whether it's, you know, like a, anything to do with the data science projects. Uh, yeah. Very cool. So basically I can not only search uh, like, like as I understand you're combining um, first of all, the tools or like if, if something was done in Python or in R or in Tableau, like I don't know, right? Like I might be, might only know Tableau, right? Or might only know Python. I don't know what other people sure. have done in other tools. Um, or, or even if I've worked in many tools, I can actually uh, put those entries into a cursor and that way I will know what I've done across different tools. Like keep track of it across different uh, platforms. Right. In, Plus, and the goal is to prevent yeah. rework, right? Like we don't want to have to have you pull in everything manually. So in many cases, we built connectors. Like if you've got, you know, Tableau already, we'll you can just plug in your credentials once. We'll automatically suck everything in. Mm. We'll pull all the, the queries behind every dashboard, make it searchable. Um, and, 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 you know, the same thing goes for, for other environments too. Um, you know, and the goal again, it's like we don't want to replace every tool. We just want to bring them all together into one mm -hmm. uh, sort of searchable uh, interface. Gotcha. So that's tools. And then on the yep. other hand, you also organize across people and departments, right? So in a bigger yep. organization, if like, or even if like, like yeah, even if it's a small organization, but like decentralized, like our business is uh, across yep. different uh, countries. So if somebody's worked on a project and I don't know if they've worked, so like you, you, again, you want to reduce double work, right? Yep, that's exactly right. So, so you know, what we separate is that, you know, to know that somebody has worked on something versus being able to see the results. So um, we have teams where, okay, let's just say sales and finance. Um, there may be certain things that finance produces that they're comfortable knowing that like, okay, they worked on a quarterly sales pipeline, but they may not be comfortable sharing the results of it. Mm -hmm. So uh, what, 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 what that separates is that like, okay, the SQL query or the, or the Python code that's been written, you know, you can see that, but then the only way you can actually see the results is if you have the credentials to actually execute it. So like we, we allow you to sort of separate those two. Cause like, the model or the or the um, the code is is oftentimes less sensitive than the actual results. Uh, that's a, a challenge we see time and time again. That like, you know, why have somebody start from scratch when they can reuse eighty percent of something that someone else produced just because, you know, uh, of you know, you're on a different team. 
<laughs> yeah, gotcha. Yeah, that's that's a really cool um, idea, and I'm surprised nobody's done it before. Were you like shocked that it didn't exist? Yeah, I think it's. Um, I think it would have been difficult to do it too many years ago, and and the reason being. Like if you look at how fragmented, I mean, I would say it's becoming more fragmented, but if you look at how fragmented the tool space was even just a few years ago and how few of those were web accessible. Yeah. So like, you know, it's really easy to build an integration to Tableau because they have rich APIs you can connect to and that allows you to extract a lot of the relevant information you want to add into some sort of a search interface. But if you go back, you know, to, to the world of like SAP and Oracle, um, where that was, you know, commonly what you would see in big enterprise, uh, there weren't rich APIs and there weren't great ways to, to stitch things together. And so it would have been harder to build a solution that was um, trying to do what we're doing. And, and to, be, to be fair, we get asked to plug into those things. And depending on the product, we, we can do good sometimes and, and less good others. Um, but like it, 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 is a, um, it is something that I think in this like web era where, you know, things are built with, with, I don't know if it's collaboration, but certainly accessibility in mind and, and the ability to come from third party platforms. Um, you know, it, it's, it's getting easier to do. But yeah, I was surprised that there was nothing focused on this search problem. Mm -hmm. um, there were data catalogs and data catalogs was sort of like a, a V1 of this problem set, which is like, how do you at least provide like just a dictionary? Think of like a, a, a telephone directory mm -hmm. of data inside of a business. But the problem I saw with those, and we looked at deploy one at LinkedIn too. Um, the problem I saw with those is that like, everybody has to go upload the dictionary manually and by the time you're done uploading it and you know surveying the entire business, it's already out of date. Mm -hmm. It's like ingrained in the person's workflow. So if they're if they're not using it on a daily basis and they have to take time to separately go document something, just like documentation in general, right? Like it's not going to get done. Mm -hmm. So you know, we 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 tried to build something thoughtfully that was that was part of a user's daily workflow. Um, and then that's where I hope we can we can succeed. Gotcha, gotcha. And um, what what kind of integrations do you have at the moment? You mentioned like Python. Tableau are like, uh, can you give us like a quick overview? Yeah, yeah. So, so we've sort of focused on three areas. So, so we, you know, any data store that, that, you know, you'd want to plug into, right? From, you know, so big data, like a Hive or a Spark to, uh, you know, traditional data stores like an Oracle or Teradata or Microsoft SQL, right? And any database we, we want to be able to plug into. Um, on, on the like BI front, so we think of that as sort of layer two, um, you know, that there's Tableau, there's Click, there's Looker, there's Power BI. Um, we've started with those just because they're you know, sort of the larger, more popular ones in the market. Um, and then you're right, on, on the language front, we have, we have Python. R, R is in process, not there just yet, but it's, it's, it's on, the, on, on the horizon. Um, and, uh, and SQL, uh, lots, lots of SQL and, and various flavors of SQL, right? If you're writing T-SQL in Microsoft World, they can support that, of course. Um, and then we support a number of different operating systems, right? So we, we have a Mac client, a Windows client, uh, and a Linux client too, if you, if you want that. Um, the product is, is you know, it's, it, it's cloud-based in the sense that, like, when you share something, uh, like, if, if you write some code and we're on the same team and you want to share it with me, I, you know, that's shared via the cloud. But there's a, there's a client aspect to deal with a sort of network security layer in between. It's so like, oftentimes inside big companies, you know, all the places where data live uh, are not accessible to the clouds. So like, we couldn't directly connect to it from our cloud layer. We'd have some, you need some sort of, uh, sort of, um, you know, uh, place there's some, some place internal to be able to get into that. So you can use the, the client as a means of doing that, or you can actually deploy it on a server internally if you want. Uh, it's a, much like an R server or a, or a Jupyter notebook environment, right? You need some, some place internally for it to live in order to connect to data. Okay. <laughs> gotcha. And how, let's, let's, uh, talk about, um, actually, people using this how how has it been received but like have you had people like in companies try it out because i can imagine it, it actually solves a lot of pain points and for some of our listeners listening in they're probably already seeing this at the company they work in or uh, maybe have experiences in the past or maybe it's their own business and they're seeing it so like uh, tell us about how others have uh, perceived this and what kind of benefits has this been able to deliver yeah so i think i think it depends on the audience right so there's there's probably three or four audiences that have, that have, that have crept up. Um, I don't know if they were intentional or not. So in, in no particular order, right? So there's, there's an engineering audience, uh, like more traditional software engineering. Um, you know, they may support a data organization or an analytics team, but uh, you know, they'll oftentimes have queries that they want people just to be able to see. They could be health checks. They could be, 
you know, just, just actually like business insight type information, like, Hey, here's a metric that we look at that we monitor. Um, and they, and they've used the tool as a, as a way to like democratize that, make it easy for other people to come find it. Um, you know, if they want to go on vacation, not have to worry about, they're going to get a phone call just to get a snippet of code. Um, you know, like, like Git or tools like that do a great job of, of documenting code and, and sort of version control, but they may not have the business context. And so they'll use our product as a means of, of uh, you know, sharing that. Uh, so that's, that's sort of software engineering. Um, on the data science front, I think, you know, uh, it's probably more coll in collaboration with like a BI team or an analytics team where, you know, too much of data science has become data prep. Like how, how do you get, you know, dirty data or, or the right data in, in, in a format that you can then actually start performing, you know, uh, you know machine learning on or, or, you know, for that matter, even just modeling. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, where data science teams and BI teams have come onto the platform, like if the BI team comes first, which has been a common trend, um, they'll get all their code in there. And then a data scientist that might want to go look at, you know, hey, is there something predictive in this data set that we could use or we could monetize? Um, they'll at least know, okay, I'll take the code the BI guy uploaded, I'll get the result set, and then I can just go. And I don't have to waste time finding the data, you know, prepping it, getting it ready for, for you know, whatever I'm trying to do to it. So that's probably audience number two is this sort of joint BI data science audience. And then um, audience number three, coincidentally, is like, is like a business user. So somebody who spends all day looking for like a report or an answer to a question, they don't know whether it's in Salesforce or Tableau, or they just need to ask the analyst sitting next to them. And they're looking for a quicker way to not bug people over email or Slack or whatever it may be. And so they're, uh, they're using the product and sort of asking the team like, hey, can you start using something like this so that I, I can you know, not bug you as much. <laughs> and that's sort of, I think one of our, our, our selling points, right? It's like, hey, if you're, if you're a business leader and you're constantly bugging someone for answers to questions, like, you know, for your sake and theirs, like, you know, put it all in one place so that you can come find it. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's kind of like uh, you're benefiting from this network effect. Yeah, it's right. classic Silicon Valley <laughs> startup. Same thing, yeah, exactly. It, we, we didn't invent that, right? Like same yeah. thing Slack sells, same thing, you know, uh, even, you know, self-service BI, right? The tableaus. Yeah. Same thing, like, hey, if you've got a dashboard, come find it, right? Yeah. But, but not everything's in a dashboard. And for that matter, not every dashboard is accurate. <laughs> and not so every dashboard is Tableau. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 those are probably the three audience, right? Like engineers, analysts, and, and, and business leaders that, that use the product or, or that are driving to push the, the adoption mm -hmm. of the product. You mentioned four audiences, no? So what? You said so four. Data scientists and business analysts. Uh, okay, gotcha. <laughs> okay, very yeah. cool, very cool. Um, and I actually want to talk a bit more about the, the business audience, right? So as the, the way I see it is it's not just like business leaders for sure, executives and directors, but also I think this could be useful for pretty much anybody in the business, like as organizations and like the world is moving on to towards a more kind of like data driven type of environment approach of doing business. And like every business is trying try to become data driven. Um, you actually, you talk about this concept, the whole notion, and maybe it's a good time to talk about this, the yeah. citizen data scientist, right? So let's talk about yeah. that a little bit. Yeah, data science is fascinating, right? Like I think it almost feels to me like the early days of BI where, or should I say self-service BI. Um, <clears throat> you know, so self-service BI, I think the sales pitch was like, you know, oh, you know, if you build this cube, which is what it used to be, right, <coughs> excuse me, then, um, <clears throat> anybody can come to this system and ask a question and it'll give you the answer, right? Like how many products did we sell yesterday? How many employees do we have in this country? You know, how many of them uh, graduated from this college? Like you can always come up with a question that a self-service BI system may or may not be able to answer. Right. Um, and, and data science sort of feels like, you know, a similar problem set in the sense that like there are really hard data science problems that require, you know, someone with extensive statistical understanding and, you know, math capabilities and the ability to code and, uh, and all that. But there's also um, a set of data science problems that, that should be approachable to what I'd call like a technical business analyst or a citizen data scientist. Um, and so, you know, I, I think helping those folks uh, like feel comfortable exploring data and, and, and playing with it and, and using tools, whether it's cursor or there's sort of even a growing um, like auto ML uh, set of solutions, right? How do you automatically model, um, you know, uh, 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 you know throw a, a number of different models against the data set and figure out what's predictive, right? Like someone should be able to, 
feel comfortable using that if they're comfortable writing SQL. Uh, and something like data robot, you mean? The, yeah, data robot, or there's, I mean, there's a number of different, I mean, Azure has one, right, that, that's yeah. in the world, and I think Amazon's in the process of making one, right? Like, I think that um, there's, 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 a, there's an audience for that, um, uh, that like type of use case where like, you know, maybe 60% of the ML problems might be solvable by that audience in the next five years. I mean, not today, at some point soon. Um, and maybe it's more than 60, I don't know. Uh, and, you know, I think that the challenge is sort of like, how do you, like, how do you help breed these, these, these folks that, are, you know, they may be stuck in their current day job and how do you help sort of encourage that type of exploration and, and understanding. And so, um, you know, I think that's, that's a little bit of what, um, you know, Cursor can hopefully help with, but, but it's also, it's not just Cursor, right? It's, it's, it's just, uh, how do you encourage people to, to take that leap, right? And so um, we saw that a lot at, at, at LinkedIn where, you know, somebody that was a technical analyst would just start playing with Python. They'd take a course, um, you know, sometimes on Udemy, right? <laughs> and they'd, uh, they'd, they'd, they'd figure out, hey, like there's something more than just pulling data that I can do that might be more valuable to the business. And just like understanding that that opportunity is out there is, is, um, is the only thing stopping them. Um, that's, I don't know if that answers what you're getting at, but yeah, there's, a, there's, a, there's definitely a growing audience there and I see it. Um, it's probably going to be the SQL user of today. That's the citizen data scientist of tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. And like to your point, I recently read a, I think it was like a study somewhere. Uh, not recently, obviously I, I remember it better, but it was a while ago. Um, and it's, uh, what they did a bit of a different, um, situation, but to illustrate the same concept that they were developing certain, um, I think it was certain drugs to fight like some kind of diseases and like they, and they, with drugs, you need to like put the chemical formula together in order to, you know, like, and they had like the modeled environment prepared. So basically there's like this environment where everything, all the tests can be run, but now it's just about like, you know, iterating and trying out these millions variations of the chemical compounds and formula. <laughs> And so what, instead of like doing internally or running like, you know, brute force through it and then like running simulations, what they did is they opened up um, a online place where people, anybody could go and like just try it out for themselves. And so people like random people from all around the world would log in or don't even log in, just go there and like, you know, drag around, drag and drop these, you know, chemical compounds <laughs> and click run and see what comes up. And in the end, like they came up like with the, the most non-standard and they solved all the problems. So they found all the right uh, compounds that they needed. And so that just shows that like even people who don't understand like chemicals and, and drugs, sure. and bacteria and, and all these diseases and stuff, yeah. they still have creativity, right? They, people can oh still, God. you just provide a self-serve drag and drop type of environment. They can solve probably like half or like you say 60% of your business problems can be solved by people just in their spare time. Like, Oh, you know, let me try this machine learning algorithm and things like that. And I think uh, what you're doing in cursor is like a, a massive step towards that. I think that uh, with time businesses not only need to leverage their data more, but also the creativity of the people that work there in general. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's a really good point. Like I think, you know, there's, <clears throat> If you open the newspaper every morning and you look at, you know, headline of, okay, this company had this much of a data breach and, you know, then the sort of repercussions, right? There's a, there's sort of this, um, you know, desire to just crawl into a shell. Mm -hmm. uh, we used to joke, so the last, the last role I was in in LinkedIn, I actually helped work on, on the security side of the house. And, um, you know, it, it was interesting, you know, the, we'd walk into a meeting and, you know, there, sometimes you'd have some pessimist or, or there'd be a, a negative tone to it. And, yeah, I'd always say, well, okay, you can just turn off all the servers and go home and then there's no security risk. Right? <laughs> you have no business either, but like, you know. Um, so I think there, there, there needs to be a, a comfortable way to allow people to, like you said, experiment, explore, learn. Because your, your employees are your biggest advocates. I mean, generally speaking, you know, there, there's always going to be bad actors, but, you know, rarely are they internal. Um, and so, you know, the, the, this balance of like, okay, how do you trust, but then, excuse me, also have some security around, around how you do it um, is, is an important one to strike. So yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Like how do, you, how do you open things up as much as you can without you know, putting yourself at risk? Um, that, that's a question I think people are grappling with. And even you know, Cursor, like we, we often live in a hybrid environment. So like 
companies have some data in the cloud and some on-prem and I don't see that mix changing. Like I don't think it's going to go hundred percent cloud anytime soon. And mm -hmm. yet if it did, it would open up so many different opportunities from like an infrastructure perspective or like a you know, tool perspective and what they could use and how, how it would actually benefit the company. But because of the security fear they have, like, you know, data is probably one of the last things to go to the cloud, unfortunately. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, good. Gotcha. And also, you know, big companies, uh, like a lot, of, a lot of these large corporations have so much momentum that you yeah. know, it's going to take years before things change there. Um, yeah. Okay, so like, uh, obviously Cursor is, uh, you know, solving a very interesting problem and, and like looking, like very forward looking tool. What would you say to those listening who are, like they see the value of course, but they're not ready to go ahead yet. Like they want, uh, you know, they want to, they want to build a data driven culture with citizen data scientists, but uh, not, not yet there that to invest in a tool like Corsair. What would you, like any advice for uh, business leaders or even people in organizations that are of that mindset? Yeah. I mean, I think the, the key is just to always experiment. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the, whether it's to try open source tools and, I know there's some apprehension in large corporations around open source, not, not because of cost, but because of, you know, support and, and you know, security and that kind of thing. But, but I think if you're, if you're a company that's, that's not always experimenting and looking for ways to use data to, you know, to, to drive efficiency or, or productivity, or, or even, you know, if you want to use the phrase like, you know, a monetary gain, right? Like mm -hmm. uh, not doing that, then your competitors are. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we, we were joking the other day, it's like, okay, you know, what, what companies have been displaced in the last 10 years, you know, it, it, by, by the Amazons, the uh, Uber lifts, the, uh, you know, what industries have you know, had been turned upside down and, and are going to be turned upside down. And it's, it's all just data, right? Like Uber and Lyft are still using the same cars, but, you know, they, they may reduce the number of needed cars on the road in the next 10 years because of whether it's self-driving or just data and being able to put cars at the right place at the right time. And, uh, same thing with Amazon, right? They're not selling any different products than all the retailers down the street. They're just delivering it in a better fashion. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, it's, uh, it's fascinating, I think, to me that companies would be afraid to experiment. Um, and I think, you know, oftentimes I, th I see that coming from, this is actually something I've seen as, as from Cursor and, and from before Cursor as a consultant, like, you know, it, it, not listening to people that are actually in the trenches on a daily basis is usually where that sort of... Uh, you know, mindset will set in and, you know, people that are actually interacting with, and, you know, there are plenty of people in the world that are still looking at an Excel spreadsheet every day and spending hours a day manually cleaning data, mm -hmm. like, you know, not helping them find a solution to get out of that is like, you know, you're, you're wasting a very valuable and productive person's time mm -hmm. um, doing something that can be automated in an instant. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that you're not helping anybody, the company yourself, you know, that person, um, what's more than likely to happen is that person will quit and then go find a better job in your company. Yeah. You'll, you'll have to suffer the pain and consequences. Right. Um, okay. But yeah, I think just always experiment and find time to do it. Right. Carve out 20% of the quarter or the, or the year to just, or maybe it's less than maybe it's 5%, who knows, whatever it is, but some amount of time to, to look at ex ways to do things better. Mm -hmm. Question. So experiment, very, very valuable advice. Um, what about like, uh, spreading data literacy. Any thoughts on that? Like how, how does a, yeah. an executive inspire people in the company to become more, to want to become more data literate? Yeah. So, so I think uh, there's always going to be a crowd that's, that is literate, right? It may be a small analytics team. It may be a CIO's organization or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but, but I think making, uh, I don't know if it's a requirement, but, but, you know, inspiring them to, to teach the rest of the organization. So we had these, uh, like brown bags constantly at LinkedIn where, you know, we would invite, uh, almost anybody to come you know, listen to a talk on a data topic mm -hmm. and, and it was sort of, a you know, it was a big deal for the author to like put together the content and to be able to actually like articulate it and document it in a way that was easy to understand. But it was also a really exciting to go listen to it if it wasn't a domain that you were a part of. And so like having that kind of a conversation and, and giving it a, a forum, I think is, is one way to start increasing data literacy. That's not even doing it in a systematic way, right? That's just, Hey, how do you, you know, have, have sort of a conversation about it? Um, you know, two, I think is, uh, you know, teams that work with data, finding a way for them to, to share with those that might care what they're 
you know, we, we made it a basic goal every quarter for all the teams to send out an email update um, of, of all the work they were doing. It's like, what are the priorities? What got done this quarter? What's going on, what's going on next quarter? And we actually emailed it to basically the entire company, right? Even in sales, you would get updates from data infrastructure. They would say, hey, we're adding 10,000 Hadoop nodes and here's what that's going to do for us. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, they may not care, but like the ones that do care, will, you'll quickly identify because they'll raise their hand and say, hey, I want to know more um, mm-hmm. and, and I want to help. And so that's, that's, you know, that's a great way to, 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 to I think, get started around literacy. And, um, you know, certainly collaboration products, products can help. It doesn't have to be ours, right? Like mm-hmm. there's tons of tools in the market that uh, whether it's Jira or um, Slack or something like that, right? Just, just allowing people to have a conversation helps, uh, helps create empathy and, and ultimately helps, uh, I think, solve problems. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, gotcha, gotcha. What, what'd you call them? Brown bags? I didn't quite understand that. Oh, bring a lunch, brown bag, like a brown paper ah. bag. <laughs> yeah. Ah, okay, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, you know, like people literally didn't, right? They'd be at a cafeteria and we were spoiled. But uh, like yeah. it, it, in the olden days, right, you'd bring a brown paper bag lunch. And so like that was, um, that was, uh, you know, you'd have your sandwich and your soda and your chips and <laughs> that's what you'd uh, so Like even during lunchtime. I, I remember we had those yeah. at Deloitte as well. It was really, yeah. Yeah, I think... Uh, goes back to a, a different time. <laughs> yeah, 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 gotcha. Okay, so experiment. Don't be afraid to experiment and uh, in, in, uh, empower people by, yeah, with conversations about data literacy. Because you're right, like, uh, that's where the world's going. Organizations are going to be doing more and more of that. And people yeah. want that. That's what I find. Like, people are so fascinated with data these days that, like, uh, surprisingly, like, a, a very um, large segment of uh, employees who actually want to be more involved in this in this space because they see they see the value yeah. and they see this as something that like inevitably it's it's part of our lives more and more like with uh, social media and so on so they're like oh cool i can you know we can do this in business something exciting interesting right i mean there's not a person in the organization whether you're picking up the phone and realizing that okay we need a prompt for people that have this question mm-hmm. or or uh you know you know, or, you know, making lunch and realizing, oh, I got to, you know, uh, uh, refresh this, 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 uh, you know, this type of food more often because it's, there's, there's always, everyone has a thought on data. And so giving them a forum to, to do that and, um, or an executive, right. That's wondering like, why can't I get a quicker answer to this question to take six weeks? <laughs> there's always, there's always someone that, that needs help. And, um, yeah, I, I think it's makes sense that you know, making it easier to get to would be yeah. positive everybody yeah hey adam i wanted to ask you another thing like i know you guys have for course you have a uh it's like a free version how does that work like because uh, as i understand like you, you would need some like an executive would need to approve it and install in the business that's a long process how does the free version work yeah so, so the free version is actually pretty good like it it, it, uh, it does you know quite a few things i think out of the box and so the free version it uses our cloud so you, you would download a client in your local machine much like you would a, a Python editor or a SQL editor. Um, and, and just like you uh, use other sort of cloud-based tools, think like Dropbox or Evernote or that kind of thing, um, the work that you do, uh, you know, gets shared to the cloud, right? And you can determine how you want that shared. You can determine if you want it visible to your team or just to you. Um, but the idea being that like the data never leaves your, your network. So like if you're running code, like the data lives on your local machine, but the code and, and, and the metadata. So like, hey, you worked with this table or, um, you know, this was, this was some query that you wrote and this is you know, what actually like the, the columns and the rows of the table right. that, right. So the, the, yeah, the, the, the names of the columns, that kind of thing that gets shared to the cloud. So okay. if, if you wrote something that says, okay, uh, how many, um, you know, laptops did we sell in, in, in Brisbane this year? Um, and, 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 you know, there's a guy that's in New York that wants to know that same question. Um, they can discover that code. They still need the credentials to be able to actually run it. Yeah. Um, it doesn't share that, but it does share. Uh, anything that's being done. So they would be able to see the database you connected to, they'd be able to see the table names that you used. Um, but again, if they don't have the credentials to that database, they can't actually do anything with it. Okay. So it's it's sort of a lightweight way to get to get started. And and the idea is, you know, what we've seen is that even though oftentimes, you know, IT or legal or security may need to get involved, um, most companies will have like a way or a user that'll try it on their side time at home to, to be able to play with something. Yeah. Um, and if they see that, that, hey, this is great, this is useful, um, it makes the process of, of getting it in the enterprise version a little bit easier. So yeah. um, it's a pretty fully featured 
you know, we call it the cursor core product, which is yeah. just, um, you know, sort of like the, the, the lighter weight version of it, but yep. uh, it doesn't have every integration. It doesn't have every language, um, but it has most. Mm -hmm. um, so you should be able to get a, a decent amount of value out that's of it. That's cool. And that's very nice of you to share that as well, because like, you know, especially startups that don't really, you know, have, yeah. like data is not being shared. So they don't really care about their intellectual property at this stage. Like they could use that, especially if like decentralized, like, like maybe, maybe I'll sign up and use that for our company yeah. now. Because <laughs> we're decentralized and we have that problem a lot. Like everybody's all over the world and it's different right. time zones. It's so hard to get to the bottom of things sometimes. So yeah, like uh, the free version would work there as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, very cool. Well, Adam, thanks so much. It's, uh, it's been a pleasure. We've coming close to the hour mark. Um, before I do let you go, I wanted to ask you, what are some of the best ways that our listeners can get in touch, follow you, your career, or maybe uh, get in contact to learn more about Cursor? Yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, certainly feel free to reach out to me directly. I mean, I'll, uh, my email is just adam at cursor.com. You know, our website's cursor.com. Check it out. Feel free to download the product. Um, you can follow us on Twitter, you know, Cursor Data. Um, but yeah, we're, we're, uh, yeah, we'd, we'd love to chat and hear what people think, right? Good, bad, or indifferent. Awesome, awesome. And uh, okay for people to connect with you on LinkedIn as well? Sure, always. Awesome. Fantastic. Okay, Adam, thanks so much for coming on the show. It's been a massive pleasure for you. No, 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 thanks for having me. It's really been, been awesome talking to you as well. So there you have it. That is Adam Weinstein, co-founder of Cursor. Hope you enjoyed this podcast. My personal favorite part was the whole notion of organizing data science assets. I'm very surprised that no company in the world has been doing this as actively as Cursor. And I think it's a very apt problem that needs to be solved because more and more companies will want to become data literate, uh, data driven, and will want to introduce citizen data scientists. And a tool like that can really help out with that. Um, so on that note, if you'd like to get the show notes for this episode, head on over to superdatascience.com 229. You'll find all the materials that we mentioned in this podcast, plus the URL to connect with Adam, and of course, the URL to Cursor, which is cursor.com. If you are interested in building a uh, data literate organization and helping organize your data science assets, then check out Cursor.com, check out their product and see if it can help you. So they have, as you know, they have the core of Cursor, which is a paid product and might be interesting to larger organizations that are ready to make the jump. If you are not there yet, then they have a free version, which you can try out in the cloud and see how that works for you. Um, on that note, thank you so much for being here and spending this hour with us. Can't wait to see you back here next time. And until then, happy analyzing. <laughs>